My name is Perry Kasich, and I am the interim chair of the Old Town Hall Board, otherwise known as the Brookfield Community Partnership. And we are exceedingly happy, not only that you're here, but how so many of you are here tonight for the presentation. Now, I know some of you actually wanted to come to have John Benson to explain the grand list. Well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> What we're going to do tonight is get very well educated about the history of dairy farming in Brooklyn. And we are delighted to have Keith Sprague here uh, to do it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Before I do that, I wanted to tell you that the reason we're doing this is because this was a, a joint project between the Brookfield Historical Society and the Brookfield Community Partnership that, that, that runs or managers or what have you, the Old Town Hall, both organizations which are, are completely voluntary. And the reason that we can do that is because of your generous support, both during our fundraising for the, for the Old Town Hall that we do, and also for people who join the Brookfield Historical Society as members. And I'm especially interested in that because I'm the membership chairman, and I really want your membership right now, not really. Um, so it's a joint project, and uh, yeah, I think it's the beginning of a lot of group activity, joint activity that we can do between having the capacity to have events at the Old Town Hall and to have delved even further into the history, the wonderful history of Brooklyn. So that welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And let me tell you a little bit about the <coughs> Barry, can you give me the microphone? Sure. <coughs> Now you're going to suffer to hear me back there. Okay. You want me to do that all over again? Oh, I think so. Keith Sprague, uh, Keith Sprague uh, the Brookfield native, represents the fifth generation to operate the family's dairy farm along the middle branch of the White River in Brookfield. Keith attended high school in Randolph and in 1993 received a degree in mechanical engineering from Vermont Tech. For the next five years, he was employed as an engineer by Applied Research Associates, a national research and engineering company. In 1998, when his father, John, retired, Keith opted to take over the family farm, readily forsaking engineering for agriculture. Since then, under Keith's management, the dairy herd has grown from 100 to 700 milking cows. And he now employs a workforce of 16. Keith was one of the first farmers in the region to adopt no-till crop, cropping practices which combat soil erosion and run-of-the-mill run nurturing microorganisms run off while run, run, nurturing microorganisms in the soil. In 2008, the Sprague Dairy was designated Vermont Farm of the Year. Keith has served on the board of directors of the Farm Credit East and a co-op uh, cooperative financial institution serving the needs of agriculture, forestry, and fishing. Currently, Keith serves on the Brookfield Select Board as the road commissioner following in the footstep of his father, John, who served for 24 years as a select board member. Keith is also a long-standing member of the Hebert stock car racing team that competes in the American Canadian Tour. Keith and his wife, Chelsea, hi, Chelsea, <laughs> are the proud parents of two daughters, Sarah, a sophomore at UVM, and Annabelle, a freshman at the University of Kentucky, who had an equestrian competition last week in Lexington, Kentucky, won the title of the Young Rider National Champion. Wow. So how we're gonna proceed is that Keith is gonna make his pre pre presentation with a wonderful uh, slideshow that was prepared with uh, Ashley Lincoln, who has got the clicker in the room to help him proceed with that. And after he gives this presentation, I'll come back up 
and field help Keith field questions from the audience. So here you are, boss. My, thank you. I just, probably does not need to be said here, but this is not my natural uh, setting, standing standing in in, uh, in front of this crowd here. Um, yeah, you, you put me in uh, ten people and a beer in my hand, and like uh, everything is just goes a lot easier. Right? Anyway, we'll we'll get through it. I think. Oh, and and the other thing about me is I'm a paper guy here, so you can see this old school stuff up here, which is the same as the presentation. I just got some of my notes on it, and so you'll see me stumbling through that as, as we go along. Um, anyway, and also, as you'll see, that uh, I need glasses now. And then, but, uh, yeah, so there's, there's um, the, the Historical Society and the Old Town Hall, you know, asked me to do this, and, and so I'm standing up here um, <clears throat> more or less the face of the farm um, that many generations you know, have worked hard to bring. And um, so I just want it to be known that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my wife Chelsea is, is very much, very much the reason and very much the face of this farm, not just myself standing here. So, and she's here in the room. And, 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 and the the other two people I'd like to thank, which has already been mentioned once, is Ashley. Um, she has helped Ashley Lincoln, who's sitting right here, and she's helped put this presentation together. If it was not for her, it would be you'd all be getting pieces of paper handed out. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and the third is is Gary Lord. Um, so uh, probably two weeks ago, Gary Gary sends me this text, and uh, and he's like. Keith, I haven't heard from you in several weeks, and I'm getting concerned. <laughs> and I'm thinking as my mind as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm God, God, I'm, I'm not the only one getting concerned here. <laughs> I think he's, he's getting because I felt like, all right, it's like this is good. We got two people concerned here now. Uh, anyway, and so yeah, so without Gary, this whole thing wouldn't be put together. And and, uh, and Gary gave me great directions and, 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 and gave me a great horse with a cart that I could jump on and it just took off and we, we had no idea which direction it was gonna go. So anyway, with that being said, thank you, Gary, for that. So anyway, um, so the uh, leading into, from that is the development of this presentation. I would have never guessed uh, uh, I'd be standing up here presenting what I'm about to present to you when Gary first called me and said, hey, will you do something about the history of farming in Brookfield? You know, my mind instantly just went, went back to my dad, my granddad, the Churchills, the, the Wakefields go way, way back. And like, I'm like, I can just, I'm picturing myself going and knocking on doors and visiting these farms and this and that. And then as my research, as my research went on and forward, it just developed into something totally different. Um, which I, I hope you'll you'll all enjoy he, here tonight. Um, so it's more of a of a view from say 10,000, 20,000 feet, looking over over uh, the history of uh, farming, and then eventually we are landing down with our feet on the ground at the end, um, and and hopefully we can tie it all together at that point. Um, so with with that being said. Um, one of the first times I came here to a presentation um, what was uh, I think a little bit about the history the history of farming or something along those lines and Kit Gage did it um, and so I want to tell t two Kit Gage stories um, that just influenced me uh, to, to this day in all truthfulness so the first was I, I think I was in third grade and when a teacher all brought us in after recess and said, okay, somebody's putting nails in snowballs, okay? This, this is not, you know, all the things, this is bad. And you can't, and it can't be done again. This was like on a Thursday or something. And so, um, or maybe a Friday, I don't remember. Anyway, 
So we're all like panicking and whatever, like who's doing it, who's doing it, nobody really knew who was doing it. So that, that was all, all fine. The next day, I don't remember it being an issue, um, which I think was a Friday, and then Monday I came into school and, um, and, and uh, the print, Kit Gage was the principal, and, he, and, and, and also our neighbor and growing up, and he came into the class and, and he made an announcement that there was more nails and snowballs and he's gonna go through everybody's jackets and snowsuits. This is like snowsuits, remember putting on snowsuits, right? Yeah, so anyway, and I'm like, my heart went right to the bottom of my feet and I'm like, oh my God. So. I knew that weekend I had helped my dad build the shed and I had nails. I had a handful of nails. So I remember on the school bus having this handful of nails in my pockets. Anyway, so I'm like watching Kit. He's go through and he stops at my snowsuit and he feels the nails, takes the nails and he said, oh, whoever is this is, I wanna see in the principal's office. So he about died when I walked into the principal's office and so what happened that day was I, first off, I didn't put any nails and snowballs. Uh, <laughs> but when he saw me, he knew exactly what had happened because he was there with my dad helping, fi helping fix his shed. And, and I just, I, I walked away that day. Uh, I probably didn't know it maybe that day, but shortly after that, I was in the right town. I was in the right group of people. Um, um, so that's the first kit gate score. The, the second one is, is he did a, a presentation here and he spoke of, you know, like say the guy in Pennsylvania that's just escaped from prison and he murdered two people and all this sort of stuff. And he spoke of farming community and the Brookfield community and him growing up and the fact that, that he grew up with life, life was a cherished thing and death happens. Um, like constantly with animals, like you learned it at a very, very young age. Um, and, and it just dawned on me that day when Kit was talking about that and, and my kids were little at that time and I went home and I made sure in the following years that they understood those values. Um, anyway, with that all being said, those two things all joined together to to bring, uh, bring together what Brookfield is and what Brookfield is to me, I think it is to a good portion of these people in this room that came out here tonight. It's just those values are instilled because um, in, in 1850, there were 70 dairy farms in this town. It, it was, everybody was a farmer. Um, so anyway, we're gonna start into the presentation now. Um, um, yeah, we can go to the next one. So, so from in 1880, there were 70 farms, as I just mentioned. In 2023, there's two active dairy farms. And the population is almost to a T the exact same um, in 2023 and 1880. How did we get there? That, this is where my research took me. How did we get there? How does it relate to Brookfield? Um, yeah, let's roll the next guy. So if we go up from up to 1845, first off, before we go beyond a little bit, so pre-1850 or so, the state of Vermont was just plastered with wood. And, and so, you know, if you just dive back in deeper, I, you, know, you could do a whole presentation on that whole era. <clears throat> But somewhere around this time, the state, uh, became, me, the state became about 10 to 15 percent. It was all long during that time. We can go to the next one. Yeah, so as we, as we spoke before on the self sufficient market, um, hand-to-mouth home consumption was happening. Uh, invention of the plow with heavy manure practices resulted in higher yields, corn, potato, and grasses. 
Uh, hay production at this time was the most nutrient value sold in the Massachusetts markets. Uh, there were four million sheep in Vermont at that time. Uh, 57 cents is a pound was what was paid for wool. Um, just on a side note, as it'll tie in later on, the Erie Canal opened, opened, opened in 1825. Um, yeah, it's about 90% 90, 90 of the land was bare by 1850, as I, as I was saying uh, earlier. The, the, the plow was invented in 1937 by, as we all know, uh, the green tractors, uh, John Deere. Um, and so that plow is what took us from this era into the next area, but, but, era. but before we get to that, um, so like some of these things in my research, can you back up Ashley to the, the bulletins? Um, like the, the hay produced at this time the most nutrient value and sold at Massachusetts auctions. So that some of those are all reported in the 1945 issue of what was the cultivator. Um, kind of like this, just a little newspaper that circulated around. Um, if you take, so if you, even today, even today, we see signs of this in Brookfield or particularly I do because of the amount of land that we travel over. Um, but you just go to anything in the historical society, open up any of the, the, the Brookfield Town books, um, and you'll see pictures of just land being plowed. Um, and, it, and, and this is when you start to see the farms um, go away from the self-sufficient to producing more than what they needed, and then eventually, you know, that led to the market. Um, there, so on, on my farm, we 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 farm about 16 to 1,700 acres every every year, and there are still fields that we call the old potato field. Um, and, and I mean, to to this day, um, uh, and, and you know, in those old potato fields, you see dead furrows all the time. Um, you know, some of them have been fixed and the dead furrow is just like the plow is just flipping the soil to one side and it just leaves this dead furrow and then, you know, over time they fill in and you try to get them smoothed up and whatnot, but they're still there, they're still present. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're just seeing signs of this whole era uh, every, every day. So we can go, so the Erie Canal was significant uh, in later events, um, but these are just some of the great technologies or not, you, whatever your opinion is, uh, that advance things along here. So that brings us to the next phase, uh, Sheep King of the Hills, um, from 1845 to 1900. And we can go on, next one, Ashley. There's a picture of a uh, uh, hillside with sheep. Um, so there's, I think, some of the attraction that happened with Vermont. Um, it was just easy landscape for this for this sort of thing to happen. Um, uh, th throughout this phase, there's a lot of things that 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 did happen. Um, so before we dive into them, on some of my notes, I have a little bit more information here. But in 1814, the first textile mill opened uh, in in Boston by a guy named Francis Lowell, um, and I. And that the town that that was built in was named after him uh, because of that time. And whether it still is today, I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, I, I did. Um, anyway, uh, around uh, 1830, there was a million. There, oh, sorry, there was a less than a million sheep uh, in the time. So this is 1830, um, and so. Uh, Jumping forward a little bit now, there's 33,000 farms in Vermont. So uh, a farm in definition at this time, 99% uh, of them had dairy on them. They had many, many things. They had sheep, they had chickens. Um, <laughs> excuse me, in, in 1850, there's 3.4 million pounds of wool. That, that being produced annually, and that supplied half of the wool needs in all of New England. Um, so the, 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 the use of the wool in the early, early times were burned down for potash or fertilizer for fields. 
um, were used for insulation, and then in the later times, uh, it was heavily desired in the textile mills, you know, for clothing and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, as we as we move along through this era, uh, at the peak of the sheep era, there's 33,000 sheep in the state of Vermont, and there was also 33,000 people. So it, it was the two were equal. Um, by the end of this era, if you remember from the previous slide, it was 57 cents for a pound uh, of wool. So it's less than half um, what it was. So the, the, the writing was on the wall. So what, what made these things happen? Um, well, before we get on to that, uh, on a side note, I, I did look, because during this time, um, it was it was around the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, there were chicken farms propping up here in Vermont, all the way, and so um, you see evidence of that in Brookfield. It's not heavily spoken of in the deep in, in the research that I did. I, it must not have been maybe significant enough to to be worthy of of it. But even where my farm is, just just a few miles or not less than a mile down the road is the you know, resemblance of an old chicken farm there. So I know I know there they that happened. I just didn't so how how do, how does this tie into Brookfield, you know, all these state of Vermont numbers. Um, you can go into any field. I, I, I see it daily, saw saw it multiple times today on Sarah Isham's land and Charlie Blue's land is their stone walls. The stone walls were there to clear the land, and then they were a natural fence for the sheep. So the feet, the sheep would would hesitate on those, and that was that was how what the start of it was. The obvious hillsides in Vermont, you know, back to that picture, um, you know, and then like I spoke of the the sheep, the sheep pastures uh, story. So during during this time. 1849, the rail system enters Vermont for the first time. This, this, uh, this was the death of the sheep industry. So what happened? If I had more notes on that, yeah. So what happened during this time was um, the, the 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 textile or the textile mills in Boston, where many of them propped up, and Vermont was feeding those textile mills, and I know where it is in my notes here. And so at, at, the, at that time, Vermont had between one and two dollars per head is what it costs annually to, to per head of sheep and, and to get the wool off of it. So the West was doing it for 25 cents an animal. So when the railroad, and which was happening the whole time, but when the railroad finally came through and weaseled this way into the lower New Englands and up into Vermont, it just, the textile mills were just turned to their neighbors in the West, and that's where all, all, the, uh, all, the, all the product for the textile mill was coming from, from those sheep farmers there. Um, so the rail system changed some things. With change came, we can go to the next slide, Ashley, thanks. Jersey Girls, Queen of Butter. So, there is a prime example of the Jersey Girls. Yeah, a beautiful cow. They were the first dominant breed here in Vermont and, and very much so here in Brookfield, uh, just, as, just equal, equally so. So on Jersey girls. So at, during this era, it was up to 40 million pounds of butter was pr produced here in Vermont. St. Albans Co-op, which was up in St. Albans, Vermont, uh, shockingly as, as that is written right there in bold letters, it was the world's largest supplier of butter at the time. I, I, I had to look it up in multiple uh, things to just Get, get my head around that. Um, d d d during this uh, during this time, what ended up 
at first being a blessing, the reefer car was invented. Um, maybe we can show a picture of that. Ashley, is there? Yeah, so there's the reefer car invented by Jonas Wilder. And so he worked for Central Vermont Railroad uh, at the time, uh, not a, a native Vermonter, but ended up living in Vermont and working uh, for the Central Vermont Railroad during, d during this time, putting the railroad tracks in up into the northern Vermont. And he could just see that these guys were all these northern farms, mid-state farms, were having to truck all this butter down to Boston and losing half of it, and or people are building creameries uh, around the area. Um, like there was one in West Brookfield, uh, 1900s, that was built. Uh, anyway, so he invented the reefer car, and at first it was a blessing, and it changed it so they could move, they could move butter efficiently uh, and very quickly into the Boston market compared to what it was. Um, so that happened. Another, a, a, another thing that happened in, in these two areas, which were extremely important, Gustus D. Laval uh, invented the cream separator. So you know you could take milk and put it in there and separate the cream um, from from the milk, and then you know from there you can make the butter. So a very important uh, invention to happen at that time. The second, what's the uh, the second is the um, the bag Babcock tester, which te could test the butter fat of someone's milk. So you knew, you knew, uh, you could put a new value on milk, and see. And so th that helped influence the Jersey area era because the Jersey cow had extremely more butter fat than than the Holstein cow. So that that built up this Jersey cow during this whole time. Um, uh, and, uh, so Cabot, if you back up again, Ashley, Cabot Creamy was formed in 1890, $3,700 investment from 94 farms. This will play into significance as time goes on, but it was invented, you know, or, or formed during this time because of the Jersey era, because of the need to make butter and, and, and also cheese. Um, and so that's why it was formed. Um, uh, that's an interesting little side note here. So, milk price in today's world is it's fairly low right now at 20 bucks. At this time, it was a dollar 13 and, and a high of 2.95. Just to tie things in perspective. How, how, do all, how does all this relate to Brookfield? How 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 are we seeing this in Brookfield? So, if you did a little more research. Um, at, at this time in Brookfield, there's 567 cows in Brookfield, um, 415 of them were jerseys. Um, if, you, if you walk in some of these older barns that are all storage now, hay storage, equipment storage, or I don't know what storage, junk storage probably. Uh, I mean, you can see the, the history of the Jersey cow without there even being a cow in there. You know, a stall's four feet long. Um, everything is really low. You got to bend over. Um, uh, yeah, and, and then and then the West uh, Brookfield Creamery, which was formed and built in 1900s, um, and it was all because of the Jersey cow. Um, yeah, and then obviously any old pictures that the Historical Society has is just, you know, loaded with Jersey cows. Um, anyway, we, if we can, Ashley, move on to, we did the reefer car. Oh, so, yeah, so the reefer car, I spoke earlier, um, what was a blessing when it first came on. So what killed this era here is also the reefer car. So, so the reefer car just, uh, so you know, it still exists today. It's on rubber tires and goes down the interstate at 90 miles an hour by you and moves your car off to the side of the road as it goes by. Uh, but back then, this is what a reefer car was. And so all, all, all this guy did was pack ice around it and whatnot. 
So, but what in turn happened was the reefer car, so this Jonas Wilder never got a patent for this thing. And so you can see that this era of the Jersey cow was fairly short and a lot of it was because he never got a patent and it was instantly taken and, and built in the Midwest and the West just took, took this whole era away by again being able to do it cheaper and moving product up, up into these plants. Um, at a much cheaper, much cheaper rate, um, and it, from the mul from the multiple researches that I did, uh, it, 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 a lot of it is tied to the state of Wisconsin. They they, they figure they took over seventy five to eighty percent of the sales of the state of, of Wisconsin itself. I, I suspect maybe there was a direct railroad line through there or something. I don't know. I couldn't find enough details about it. Um, anyway, I, I, I definitely did not say that this at the beginning, but if anybody does want, like, feels like they need to say something right now and can't wait to the end, just feel free. I'll, I'll keep looking. Um, so our next, our next phase is going to be another short one here, but 1920s, 1960s, the need to be fluid. So the need to be fluid uh, is a double meaning here. Uh, uh, so, so the Holstein cow be started her dominance at this time, and, and the Jersey cow uh, be began to fade. Um, and, and and so the Holstein cow had lower pounds of components, so lower butterfat, lower protein values, but she she produced a lot more milk. Um, and so because of the butter industry going down the tubes, if you will, or becoming less profitable, the Holstein cow slowly came up. So interesting things technology-wise uh, that changed throughout this time. I, Interstate 89 came through uh, in the, in the, at the very end of this era, so that probably really should have been down at the bottom. But anyway, we, we'll get the, the, the gist of it. Dairies, dairies, um, um, expansion just started happening at a rapid pace compared to what it was before. Uh, uh, diverse, diversification started to slow down and farms started just slowly turning to dairy or turning to something else. Um, uh, at, at, throughout this time, Vermont was supplying 50% of New England's milk. Oh, oh another thing that happened. Uh, in the early stages of the time, new, uh, electricity was in most every household and every barn was retrofitted with, ele with electricity. Um, uh, first of the government support programs came into place. Uh, uh, the buyout program, which was um, where, where the, the government would come in and, and purchase your your cows and equipment and pay you so much just to stop farming. So what, what was going on here was just a massive ramp up of, of, of needed fluid milk. Bottling plants were being built um, and, and so they were encouraging farms to expand and grow and do all that. So all that was happening, um, but then it just kind of slowly spiraled out of control. So as we spoke earlier, Holsteins are becoming more popular, high volume, uh, lower butter fat. Um, in the 1960s, Agrimark formed a co-op with the formation of its processors. So it's just another little side note there. You heard me speak of Cabot being formed. Uh, Ag Agrimark was a, was, had many processors at the time and they bottled milk. Um, so that, that was formed for this, this reason. Um, the, the impacts of the Great Depression led to innovation um, by a lot of Vermont farmers in this era. Um, oh, also in this time, the land use tax was, uh, was written in say Vermont by Madeline Cunin. Um, um, and then uh, so the, the signs of, of this era in Brookfield, like I, I, I wasn't alive in this era, but um, I'm sure they were even just as relevant as they are when I was when I became uh, into this world and old enough to see things. But you could just go down through 
any of any of these old farms that there's no cows on before and you can see all of these things uh, uh, forming as a, a, a as 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 the farms began to dwindle. So when, when I was a kid in the 70s, just after this era, I remember there being, and I counted them up and, and spoke to the elders around here, there was about 16 farms in Brookfield at the time, um, um, uh, you know, that were dairy farms. Um, anyway, so 19, if we go to the next one, Ashley, thank you. So here, here's a, Great picture at the very tail end of this era and maybe even leading into the next era here, as I spoke of, there's this overpopulation of milk and it all was ramped up with the, uh, um, you know, all the, the government subsidies and, and whatnot. But in 1954, the average herd size is 25 cows, 10,500 uh, farms in Vermont. It wasn't the, the slide before, we were at 23,000. I think it was the one before that. We were at 33,000 farms in Vermont. Uh, the price of milk did not keep pace with inflation. 85% of the small dairies sold out due to high debt and low profits. It, from the research that I did, Vermont is thought to have fared better during this period than its Western competitors. Um, uh, and... Uh, and, and a lot of it they felt like was because of their innovations. Uh, the, the, the Vermonters' ability to uh, turn water into wine, if you will, so to speak. Um, so, and I saw that the whole, I saw that grow, growing up as a kid. Um, you know, and so, so this, this naturally turned into the mechanical revolution. Um, and so uh, this one here, uh, I, I, I'm starting, so I'm starting at this point to, to start to narrow in to, to our farm, uh, if you will, and or I, maybe even I, I named it the mechanical revolution in my presentation and then we stumbled across this here, um, you know, from Governor Johnson. Farms bulk milk tanks are rapidly changing the method of handling milk. There are approximately 9,000 commercial dairies in Vermont at the time. Many country milk plants are being closed. This is a part of the great mechanical revolution in agriculture, which is common with all revolutions, great hardship for some people, but if wisely handled, it can reduce the cost of assembling and transporting milk and keeping Vermont competitors in our great milk market. Um, you want to actually go to the next one, please? Um, so, yeah, like he said, uh, this creates other consequences, large herds and the end of the diversified farmer uh, and the decline of the hillside farm. Uh, that was in 1996 in the time of Zargis. Um, if you go to the next one, Ashley. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so adapting to change uh, in technology, this is where the or the heading of this section need to be fluid is double meaning. Um, uh, you know, fluid milk was needed at the beginning and then all of a sudden it changed to where the farmer uh, needed to be fluid himself and able to move and able to wiggle and able to adjust um, to new technologies. Um, yeah, so the baler came in during this era, the milk machines, the artificial insemination, we spoke earlier, how electricity, uh, rolled in. Uh, you heard Governor Johnson talking about uh, the bulk tanks, uh, barn efficiencies, the tractor, uh, parlors, obviously reduced labor happened. Um, and a funny thing happened also during this time, uh, uh, there's organic diversi diversification, small processes started back up, tourism, consolidations with neighboring farms. Um, the signs in Brookfield that you see uh, on, a, on a regular basis, you know, like, so there's uh, the Sprague farm, you know, which which was spoken earlier, this is a farm that I'm fortunate enough to be a part of today, uh, is five generations now, um, and, and there's more than nine farms 
that are that have been all purchased over all these multiple generations now. Um, um, other signs uh, of, of telling in Brookfield, if, if you can just check out any other of the old dairy farms in Brookfield during this time, the, the ones that didn't, that didn't make it through this transition, um, you, you can just you can, you can just walk into those barns and you can say, okay, yeah, like, like they, they made it to the canned milk era. You know, they, they never transferred to the bulk tank. Um, there's, a, there's a farm on McKeg Road where we were just hanging in the field the other day that I walked into that barn and that, that's where that, that story ended right there was the bulk tank, you know, ultimately killed that, killed that farm. Uh, not not that all these farms like were forced out, you know. I mean, there's many that just who knows, you know. Maybe they just want to stop farming, or there's a death, or or that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of these changes are the things that either the farmer adjusted or or didn't, and and it, you know affected affected. Um, on my what was the time frame on this one, Ashley? Yeah, so on, during this era, like on on my farm, um, uh, it was in my dad's era at that point, and I remember very. How, how are we doing on time, Ashley? Perfect. <laughs> See, if I should ramp it up a little, maybe. Anyway, uh, so d during during. A story that I remember that just nails this era is I remember, so we put all our silage up in old silage wagons and you would chop into the wagon and the wagon had all this mechanicalness to it to unload. And, and these things were just old weapons and breaking down all the time. And I remember saying to my dad, I was like, I'm, we need to get some new wagons, you know, next year. Like, this is crazy. And he's, and he's like, no, we're not going to get some new wagons. And I'm like, oh my God, like, oh, this is just crazy. And I, I was still in high school. And they, and, 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 and possibly college at this time. And then, and he's like, I got, a, I got a project for you tomorrow morning. And so I got up and did chores and he sent me in, my, in his pickup. I went to Donnie Davis's farm in Peachum and his neighbor had a high dump. And, 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 the, and it was the first high dump that I'd seen. I'd heard about these things and it was, feed was dumped into these high dumps and then it was side, it dumped sideways and dumps into the truck, and then and then the truck brings the the feed to the field, and so it, it it was it was just an example here in Brookfield, Vermont, of one little spot of where where that generation was able to transfer through the technology era, um, and there's and there's ones that didn't. So these farms, like I spoke of, where you could go walk visit these you know any farm in Brookfield or throughout the state and you'll see the old silage boxes still parked in the shed out back or dilapidated and trees going up in them and that sort of stuff and it's like okay that's that's where they ended in that era you know they just never made it through through that time um, anyway small example so uh, th throughout this time um, Agrimart and Cabot formed and so this was the Cabot was the first one to for, to to form the sorry they merged. So Cabot formed first, then Agrimark formed second. The two companies merged. So there was a butterfat era that was that was formed, and then there was a fluid milk era with Agrimark. Those two formed. They're still rolling today. What what were they? They were fluid. They changed. They adapted to technology. They adapted. They saw a need for each other. Um, yeah, let's move along. Just some quick numbers here. In the 70s, there's 4,000 dairy farms. Uh, the herd buyout, like we spoke of, the milk diversion program. Um, 2,000, there were down to 16,000 dairies. 100 cows was the average size. Cows were milking 20,000, if you remember. Back in the 1920s and 1960 era, they were milking around 5,000 pounds a cow. Uh, some more government government funding here with the North Northeast Dairy Compact, uh, but that ended in 2001. 
in today's world, there's 600 dairy farms in, in Vermont as we speak. The average farm size is 200 cows. The average pound of cow gives 25,000. So our last era is the technology era. Um, that, that is where I am, or I am in this era, uh, probably forced into it, luckily, um, because it's going to make the farm uh, be here in, in, in the future. Um, just, this is going to be put a few pictures here, but so I, I spoke of a, a farm on McKeg Road uh, to the left, and that's where the cows lie down. You know, obviously, it's just been dilapidated for a few years. You know, in that section, and and and, and that cement pad that's there is four feet long. And there's a gutter that you shovel manure out of. <clears throat> Here's a very modern farm uh, with stalls, sand bedding, two feet deep, and then alleys that tractors clean. So another. Uh, so that is one of my barns there. And then this is the the uh, <clears throat> where the milk was housed through that door. Uh, in this same barn that's to the left, and, and then like there's where our milk is housed in this, in this today. You can keep rolling, actually. Here's, and I don't remember the era, but it was during, <clears throat> at the beginning of that mechanical, uh, mechanical revolution, uh, and I believe that's probably up, and do you remember, Gary, is it up in uh, West Brookfield, maybe, where that photo was taken? Yeah, I think it is also. But they're baling hay. Uh, this was two weeks ago, us baling hay in Williamstown, Vermont. Uh, so those bales are the normal square bales that you we all know. These bales here <clears throat> weigh about a thousand pounds, eight feet long, four feet by four feet, and are trucked with heavy equipment. Nobody nobody touched a bale, you know, compared to the left side. Although to the left, that is corn silage there. But anyway, move forward if you can, Ashley. And then uh, there's a, a similar picture of corn silage there. And then this is on our farm one foggy morning, a uh, pile of corn silage just being shaved. And what's being shaved is what's going to be fed for that day. Um, there's, there's, uh, that's how feed is stored in a lot of these dairies today. Uh, in Brookfield or anywhere throughout the state. And then there's a silo, like how it used to be stored years ago. Uh, th there's probably many of you seen the tractor and mixer. Uh, all the feed is put into that wagon behind the tractor and mixed up and fed, and that's where grain is stored. Um, if you can keep moving. Uh, uh, again, we're in the technology area. Uh, there's a large manure pit where uh, all the all the um, uh, nutrients is stored for summer fertilizer, and and that's about a $375,000 bolt that's floating in that manure pit. That's got a uh, a large motor on it and a pump, and it's agitating the entire pit. Um, and there's tractors and and trucks and and spreaders transferring into the field. You can see a little yellow bubble on that tank. And that there is a, is a uh, manure analysis. And right in front of that is a gray bubble, and that is a flow meter. And that's all being recorded, uh, the amount of nutrients that are getting put back on the land. That very similar apparatus that I just mentioned is also on the chopper. Um, and so whatever is harvested is all recorded, the nutrient value and feed. And so all that information. Uh, is at our fingertips, and we learn from it, uh, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis or month-to-month. -month. You can skip forward here. Try to move to my notes. Yeah. So farming today uh, will we'll, uh, is I I. Uh, Happily can say, um, and although there is some resistance, but probably when it first started happening, but consumers are driving these changes. The consumer wants a certain thing. Um, uh, so organic is a great, great example of what, what the consumer wanted at one time, and some still do today. Um, the consumer wants 
many things and the farms have to adapt to those changes. Uh, the next generation of employees is a lot different than it was in my dad's era. It was a lot different than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago um, to, manage, to manage these people. Equipment upgrades like I just showed in pictures. Um, like if, if you don't keep up with these technologies, we're going to be one of those farms in the weeds uh, a generation from now. Uh, cow comfort, barn designs, monitoring. There's, there's uh, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars spent annually on my farm and many farms um, that are doing these three things just to keep, just to keep the train rolling. Um, efficient routines. So everything that we do when new barns are built is there's more thought analysis put into what is that doing to cow traffic? What is that doing to equipment traffic? What is that doing? How is that impacting um, um, entering the road, leaving the road? How is it going to impact uh, on the road? Like just numerous things so that it's efficient um, and we, we try to make as small a footprint as we possibly can. Um, and then another big thing is cow nutrition, um, where, you know, in my dad's era, you spoke about pounds of milk a cow made. In today's world, you speak of pounds of component a cow makes. So the Jersey maybe is coming back a little bit that era, but, but the Holstein makes a lot of pounds of butter fat, a lot of pounds of protein, um, more so than the Jersey ever did. Um, and it's all because of the technology and keeping up with that technology throughout this whole time frame of how cows, uh, how cows are fed. Another big thing that is helping in this whole era is the ability to pr predict the weather. And uh, obviously, what I just said is an oxymoron because it's not just, if we could, I wouldn't be standing here if I could do that. But we're a hell of a lot closer than we were uh, back in the previous generation to doing that. At least I thought I was until last night about nine o'clock when <laughs> it rained two plus inches of rain. I'm like, oh my God, my phone did not show that. Uh, th throughout, throughout this era, I have noticed that it takes balance. You can easily, 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 and I've seen it many, many times on many farms. Vermont does not uh, exclude itself from this, or Brookfield for that matter, is the balance. There's so much, te so much technology out there, so much stuff in your face of you can, you can buy this and it's going to make you X. And it, it might be, but you have to decide, is that right? Is that, gonna, is that actually going to happen on your farm? Because there's so many factors in place there. Um, and, th and then lastly in this section is sustainability. Um, we work very, very, very hard to be sustainable. It might not show and you might not think of it in a daily, in a daily manner, but, uh, or you might not see it in a daily manner if you drive by, but we are working towards that. So the cows, uh, the animal herself is sustainable. She's reproducing her, her next uh, moneymaker more so, she's reproducing more than, than they're dying off. So the cow is extremely sustainable. When we get when when a cow is is time for her to go, um, for us for consumption to go to other various sources of food, our our cow is 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 well ready for that next step. Um, so you take a calf on our farm, our, our calves are sought after compared to our competitors because we'll like say bull calf that goes on the market and goes to either to veal or to beef immediately. We, we, we put a Sprague Farm ear tag in that calf's ear and we raise that calf, we keep it, we don't let it go right off and we raise it up and so it's caught on within New, uh, the Vermont and, and New England if you will that hey there's a Sprague Farm ear tag on that bull calf, I'm going to pay a little bit more. Like in the neighborhood of two to four times more. Um, so there, you know, so there's the sustainability in the animal, sustainability in the land, like like Perry spoke of, no-till dairy farming, um, is 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 what we felt like was a step towards sustainability and being more profitable. 
sustainability employees um, are, uh, we, we keep employees a really, really long time. Uh, we put a tremendous amount of investment in them and it, sh and it shows and it's one of the biggest things that what's going to make it so that we're he the farm is here for the next generation. Um, and then we want to be sustainable and energy wise. Um, and so we're, we are con continually talking and pursuing um, solar, wind, other areas. Um, and so that's a, a little bit more of, of a tougher battle, um, but we're continuing that process uh, internally. Um, so in, in, in closing, I, I, I want to share a share two more slides and one is a visit from a guy named George Lyford and and I, you remember when that year was Ashley 1999 and this is Ashley's grandfather at the time uh, obviously still is um, but but he, 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 he's no longer with us here but Ashley's Ashley's dad and, and uncle and and probably other people brought George over to the farm that day when we were building what you see here today and 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 I and I remember I was over on the other side of the road from this farm and I was working in the shed and George came up and, and he was frail and he, he was in his last days of his life and he said to me he's like uh, Keith Keith he said this is crazy he said this fireman does not need to be this fancy or this complicated at all <laughs> and 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 I was sick to my stomach I, I, I was totally sick to my stomach and I'm like oh my god and what am I doing you know, I just borrowed millions of dollars here, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm doing this like thing that George Lyford told me I, I just did not need to do, and and uh, so that next day I, I, I got up and we had a large cement pour that day, and it was the, the largest cement pour that Carol Concrete had ever done, and so we poured cement all day, and, and I and I and I wrote a check and paid paid Carol Concrete that day, and it's only significant because several years later, like maybe 20 years later. Uh, uh, we did another large cement pour and, and I got ready to write the check and I remember that day. I remember the day George Lyford came and saw me. And, and, and it dawned on me as I was writing this check that, you know, George was absolutely right. He was like spot on and he knew exactly what he was talking about that day. But what George didn't know, and I'm not, I'm not sure that I even knew it that day. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not know it that day. Um, I just was full of youth, but um, was it, George didn't know was I was doing what I was doing for tomorrow. I was doing it so that we had a farm for tomorrow. And so next slide. With that being said, in 1945, there's 1,200 people, 567 cows, 415 were Jersey like I spoke of. There were 70 farms, two people, one cow. 2020. 1,200 people, 2,500 cows, zero jerseys, two farms, two people, one cow. Sorry, two cows, one people. That's how we got from 1945 with 70 cows to 2023 with, sorry, 70 farms, 2023 with two, two, far, two dairy farms left in the state, uh, town of Brookfield. So, Anyway, questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, any questions? Ricky? Yep, or, or comments? Who had your hand up? Uh, two questions. One was, um, you mentioned the land use, ta use tax. Yeah. Can you tell us the significance of that, if any? And um, now farms are really uh, reliant on fossil fuels. And people don't have enough to do, a lot of them. So that's kind of a question mark in my mind. You can see gray, gray hair in my head here, so already I forgot the first question. What was the first question? <laughs> oh, the land tax, right. So it's significant because, so 
if you own a lot of land and it's producing timber and or being cropped uh, for dairy or other use, then there's a reduction in taxes. So ultimately what that means, uh, like a very good friend of my dad's and what became a good friend of mine was Donnie Davis and Donnie Davis lived in Peacham, Vermont. And he stood up every year at the town meeting and he thanked the Peacham taxpayers for paying his land use portion of the taxes. Because I mean, ultimately it just gets passed on to the public. But so there's a reduction in land tax if, if it's being used for agriculture or forest uses. Um, and, and then the second question, I, I was gonna interrupt you, but I wasn't fully understanding. Fossil, fossil yeah, so we, we, do, we do burn a lot of fossil fuels. So what, is, your, is your just a concern about that or? Well, yeah, and, uh, it takes fewer people to run a farm, but in developing other people's land, it's a Yeah, you know, the, 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 the thoughts come to mind, you know, when I spoke of sustainability and like our desire to do something different with energy and we haven't, we haven't you know, nailed that, that yet. Um, you know, some, some places, the other forms of energy, the communities are resistant to, you know, wind is an example, solar is a great example. So there's a lot of hurdles to climb there. Um, I mean, I, I live in a, I can tell a, 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 a whole story for an hour, but like we attempted already to do a solar and it was, you know, just, it wasn't, the community wasn't ready for it. Um, so with, with that being said, the other side of that is also, if you want to play, if you got to just work with the tools that you're given. And so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Hi, Keith. Thank you. This is very, very interesting. Um, quick question for you. What is the average lifespan of a cow, a dairy cow? And um, what are your thoughts on robotics and technologies like drones, things like that? Are you seeing that? cropping up in Vermont, and what do you think of it? I might have to help me again, Sherry. <laughs> so, uh, I, I remember lifespan the robot. Lifespan of a cow. Oh, lifespan of a cow. And yeah. robot. Yeah, yeah, so lifespan of a cow. So, at, fr from birth to, to when she has her first baby is around two years, where, or two years of time. Um, and then uh, on average, that cow will have between three and four babies. So that cow will have a baby every 12 months. So two, five, so five, between five and six years that that, that, that 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 cow will remain on the farm and productive. So if you backed up several of those eras, uh, that the lifespan of that cow is probably double that. Guess. It's definitely longer than what it is now, and, and economics are driving all that. Um, so it's it, it's just the you know the natural cycle of a cow and her sh she can be replaced with a younger one um, uh, that's much more productive and and, and, other, and therefore more economical and therefore you know the farm is more sustainable and then. The other thing that'll happen is, so say if you hang on to that cow longer than she, and she becomes less productive, she also is less productive on the sustainable end, uh, end of her train where she's less valuable in the beef market. And, and, you're, and you're gonna, and or she becomes frailer and gets injured and she ends up in the compost pile, you know? So like, I mean, I know those are some real right in your face things there, but. You know, that's just the reality of it if you want to stay in this business and, and be here for the future. Robotics. Robotics, I, th I think, are a wonderful, great thing. Like, uh, obviously, technology is driving these next stages, and that's a great example of it. So, r there's a couple things with robotics. They, they're 
still to this point, I, I, there's probably not uh, on my hands and my toes the amount of large robotic farms in the United States are probably less than what's on my hands and toes. Robotics hasn't been able to keep up speed wise on these larger dairies. At this stage and five years ago, they were tremendous on a 50, 100 cow farm. I mean, they like they saved that era for another whole phase. Um, it, it's coming eventually, um, but a, as it is for now, like like when I built in 2000, a uh, nice red barn that you saw and all that, and, and when George Lyford came to the farm and shared his concerns with me, um, I, I think there was two robots in the United States at that point. So I was in, you know, early, or very early 2000 or 1990s. So yeah, they've come a long ways, and they're a great thing. It's really they're they're it's being forced into large dairies now, and they'll it'll happen over time here. With that being said, very expensive to very like big shift to to change over because you're essentially going from our farm, say 16 employees, you're probably going down to four. But so there's, I mean, you know, we, there's a lot of money spent on labor every year. So that goes to little to nothing, and then and then the money goes to this massive investment in robots. You can't take a barn like mine and put robots in it. You you especially these large dairies. You you wipe the slate clean and you start over. So, great question. Yeah. Another question. You mentioned artificial insemination. Yeah. In that process, do you have the ability to select the sex and... So we definitely do, and that's, that's a, you know, a great question or a, a great thing to, uh, that's just a, another example tied in with robots and, and all of that of a technology that if you didn't get on that bandwagon, you're not gonna be here the next generation. So so in my dad's era, you, you bred a cow, uh, you know, they extracted semen from a bull and froze it and yada, 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 and packaged it and got it to the farm and you could artificially inseminate and that was made world improvements because you could put a better calf in that cow. Uh, so what's happening today with the sex semen is when it, uh, so yes, you can you can buy a, semen that's got a 99.9% .9 chance or maybe 90% chance to produce, maybe it's more now. There's one guy back there that knows exactly. But uh, anyway, it's a very good chance you're gonna have a heifer calf. And um, so what happened during that time was it kind of, everybody was all oh, great, we're just gonna have heifer calves and we're gonna grow. So these farms just like, just grew like crazy because the bull calf never happened. You had heifer calves and barns were being built and all this sort of stuff. And then and then the same thing, it drove, you know, volume of milk went way up and the milk price crashed and all that sort of stuff. And so it turned into, what that turned into was, is they ended up putting caps on farms can't grow anymore. They can only produce so much milk. So what the farm is doing now, they're still breeding to that, that, that sex calf. So they're getting their female calf, but if, through genetic genomic testing and various other things, they're they're taking the best calf and they're making their herd better. So what you're going to see now is they're not they're not regulating pounds of components. They're not regulating how much butter fat we can produce and how much protein we can produce. So we're going to keep that better calf. We're going to raise that better calf. We're going to we're going to breed that better calf to a better a better semen and a better calf even so. So we're gonna make in the next generations more pounds of components which makes the milk check bigger. So that's what's happening with these farms. You're not gonna see them grow in size unless something significantly changes that I don't have the foresight to see. But this is clearly what's happening. It's been happening in the last 10 is probably stretching it about seven to five years. Um, and ramping up, and there's probably some that were doing it in 10 that were a little more advanced that saw it, you know, before before the rest of us did. But great question. Any other questions? Only one. Yep. I just like to say, um, on on behalf of all of us here, I think um, what Keith and Chelsea do, for instance, is art on the farm. 
a lot of effort goes into that, and I, I go every, every time I can, and I really enjoy it. I learn. So uh, thank you, Keith and Chelsea, for what you do for the community and art on the farm. Thank you. Another question? Here. Yeah, I know I did. Okay. Yeah, so competition from the, the goat industry. Uh, no, but I think it's like, you know, and, and I actually thought of it when I was making my hand notes that, you know, that weren't up there and the diversification thing. Um, I, I think it's a great thing, you know. It's, it's just a matter of, uh, of it taking hold and going, which it, it, it is. Um, it may be slower than, than what they wanted, right? You know, so there's Vermont Creamery. You know, which is owned by Land Lakes now, uh, up in Barrie, and and the, still to this point, the majority of their milk comes out of Wisconsin. So. What's the most exciting thing that you're that you're doing in Bar? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Well I, well, I owe a lot of money, so <laughs> that, that, that gets me up, up, up in the morning. Uh, so, like, I, I, you know, that's a really good question, and, and I, think, I, I think it's what I'm most excited about is, 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 and I'll answer it kind of broadly, but it really is this, this is, um, is I, I took over a wonderful farm that was extremely profitable and rich in the community and all that sort of stuff. And so in, early on in all those years, we wrote a mission statement and, and did all the things that a lot of you know these successful businesses do. And anyway, and, and, and one, the, the key in that one of those items in that mission statement uh, is for the farm to be here for the next generation. So I, I truly enjoyed putting this program together because I could I learned so much in those early stages and then when I got to the end stages of showing. So the answer to the question is just making the farm so it has the ability to be here for the next generation is honestly what I get up every day. So the building of, the, of whatever new project that we got going on, you know, I, I will pour myself into and that's what gets me. And then you get sidetracked and next thing you know you're in a tractor and having to help out do this or, or do that or that sort of stuff. But like, like, like the Saturday and the Sunday that things are, are quiet on the farm and I get up and, and, I, can, and I can focus uh, and have a clear mind of what's going to lie ahead for the week um, and, then, and then focus on that. So yeah, yeah, those are the things. And then, you know, of course, I love to see my children do well in life. So <laughs> but yeah, on the farm, that's what it is. Well, that was some presentation. <laughs> I learned an awful lot about dairy farming from that, and I really appreciate that. And I think everybody else did. I want to thank Keith for doing this, and I want to thank Gary Lord as the uh, president of the uh, Historical Society. I want to thank Ashley Lincoln for her technical expertise in helping uh, Keith put this uh, together. Keith, as you all know, Ashley is with uh, Gifford Healthcare and we really appreciate that help. She's also a good friend. So, um, and everybody else and the members of the, uh, the Historical Society uh, board and the, and the Brookfield Community Partnership, everybody who helped out in setting this up. So uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, it would be really helpful if as we break up and have our small conversations as we usually do at the end of the event, you'd also help us to stack all the chairs. So thank you very much, folks.